second week of a message series on the deepest desire of Jesus that we would be one in him, that his church, that individuals would be one. Our theme verse for this message series comes from Ephesians chapter 4. I'm just going to read it real quick. Paul in Ephesus writes this, and he says in Ephesians chapter 4, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. For there is one body, there is one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father over all, who was over all and through all and in all. Jesus' deepest desire is that we be one. And that sets up the reason for Pentecost. I'm going to talk more about this Wednesday night because it needs to be unpacked. But the message of Pentecost is about building church unity. And that's what I want to talk about today. You see, oftentimes we look at Pentecost and some have a vague idea, oh, that's when this whole phenomenon happened with the Spirit of God, and man, that's wacky. I'm not even touching that. Just keep me away from that, brother. I'll believe in Jesus, but that whole Holy Spirit thing. And then on the other side of the pendulum, you have people that will literally do everything they can to have an experience with the Holy Spirit. Bark like dogs, run around like madmen, and everybody in between. And we forget the larger concern is that the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit was given for a much bigger purpose than just that. Pentecost was and is a Jewish harvest festival. People would bring in the first of their harvest, and they would celebrate God's faithfulness and goodness in their life. And God, in his sovereignty, chose this day. Pentecost means 50 days after Passover. It was when people from all around the known Roman Empire would come and celebrate this Jewish festival. And it's on this date that wind and fire symbolized the presence of God. Wind and fire was always a part of the Old Testament. Wind was symbolic of God's presence. Fire was also part of his presence and purity. We see it as he led the people of God out of Egyptian slavery. We see how he was present with fire when the temple was established. Wind and fire are symbolic of God's presence, and that's exactly what happens on the day of Pentecost. And Peter, in explaining this, turns back not to some short-sighted, he turns all the way back to the Old Testament and says, remember this, your prophet Joel prophesied And he recites chapter 2, verse 17 of Joel, and he says this. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Now, followers of Jesus are to be individual temples. Collectively, faith community in every church that names the name of Jesus is to be a temple whereby the presence of of the living God can remain and reign in our church. But why? Why did Jesus want to come and live within us? One is because he loves us. Love always wants to be known. Love always wants to be close. You ever hear people say in the church, oh, I love you, brother. But the minute they're called to get in a small group or to extend past their verbal affirmation. Whoa, I I don't get too close to people. We need to learn the lesson of love. And that love beckons us to draw near to people. 
I can't tell my wife, wife, I love you, love you, but that, ooh, get, get away. Now, I'm, I'm, now, some might do that, but that's not, you understand my point. Love embraces. Love wants to be known. It draws close. Jesus loves us. He gave himself on the cross for us. Why would he not also want to then love us and know us and be close to us for all of the future? So today I want to take a look at Galatians chapter 5. Just say a few things about it. Paul is writing this to the Galatian region. It's one of his first letters. He's writing about many things, but then he begins to close his letter up by talking about life in the Spirit. Do you see that? Maybe some of you in your Bibles, you have that header at verse 13 and following. Do you have that in your Bibles at all? But I want to turn, if we can, to a little bit later and read these verses. Now, we're going to unpack this in the following weeks. So all of this passage of the middle part of chapter 5 is good. But I want to turn to chapter 5, verse 24, and I want to read verse 24 and 25. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. That's verse 24. And then verse 25 says, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. I want to say three things today, and at the end, I'll kind of show you where I'm working. But I want to start by saying, if we're to have unity, which is Jesus' primary purpose for giving us his spirit. Now listen, I want you to hear that closely. It is not for you to have some kind of experience, although there's nothing wrong with that. His spirit was giving, so that what? His deepest desire, Father, may you make them what? One. His spirit was given to us for that purpose, and if we're to build unity in the church, we need three building blocks to do so. The first is this. He says this in verse 25, the very beginning. Since we live by the spirit, the first is this. We must live by and through Jesus' spirit within us together. We need him. Individually, if you have not come to the place of your life where you understand this, I want to say it to you today. When you name and profess the name of Jesus and you believe in Jesus with the very deepest part of your life and you want him to take control of your life, you don't need to worry about where his spirit is. His spirit has come into your life. I know many people say, Sean, I, I trust in Jesus, but I don't know where his spirit is. I'm going to tell you this. You... Many people will not know. We have enabled experience to kind of confirm what we think about Jesus. Some people have a great experience when they come to know Jesus. Let me tell you and reassure you for others. Some of you will not feel a thing when you come to know Jesus. That doesn't deny the reality that his spirit has come into your life. Please don't ever feel like, I didn't cry. I didn't have a great experience. I didn't fall down. I didn't get emotional. I didn't. When you name the name of Jesus, his spirit transforms your life, converts your life, brings you newness of life, whether you feel it or not. So yes, all of us need to know, and if you've named the name of Jesus, you have his spirit. But the thing is, he not only wants us to live by his spirit individually, but his spirit is given so that all of us become part of a larger collective called the church. You and I are, called, are, are part of the universal church, but you and I are part of a local church called the Faith Community Church. You are not your own. You are Jesus, and you are part of this church. You are a hand, an eye, a foot, a belly, a spleen, a kidney. Paul says over and over again, you are needed because God's spirit within you is exactly what you and I need one to another. You say, well, you know what? I love Jesus, but I'm not going to be a part of the church. You take your hand away from the church that is needed desperately in our own church if you don't come. 
well, I can worship God on the 18th fairway. I just, I look out and I see his beauty and that's good enough for me. I can worship there. Well, friend, that may be good enough for you, but what about us? We need you to be a part of this church so that the functioning body of church here at Faith Community, Faith Community can be what we're always called to be. It's not about you just sitting on the fairway and, isn't this beautiful? I can worship God. I know you can worship God there. We need you to be a part of the faith community church because we need to worship Jesus collectively. And if your arm or your foot or your eye is gone, guess who suffers? The church, which is Jesus' primary concern, that they be one together. God gave his son, who then gave his spirit to us so that we could live by and through his spirit together. Second, we must be led by and depend upon Jesus' spirit within us. I, I sometimes throw in some translations of scripture that are not the New International Version. I read that because it's readable. But sometimes there are other translations that are good. And the New Living Translation looks at the last part of verse 25 in a different way. And it says this, and throw it on the screen. Let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. I think that's what Paul is trying to say here. The NIV says what? And let us keep in step or be led by the Spirit. But I think this, and let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our life. Do you know it's hard to be together? You know that. It's hard to date. It's hard to marry. It's hard to have kids. It's hard to have good friends. It's hard to know what to do with your work. It's good to know how to treat people in your life. We need God's leading in our life at all times. We need God's leading here at this church. Friend, you should pray. Now listen, even today we have a board meeting where we discuss just where the general church is going, direction that we're, the finances, the ministries of our church. When you get out of your car, you should say, Lord Jesus, would you be present with us today? And Lord Jesus, would you be, would you be with us? Would you help us and lead and guide us? You know what? I want to say this to you, and I think some of you will be able to understand this. A church can be following and receiving the blessings of Jesus in their midst. And all that it takes is a season, and I'm going to even tell you before that, all that it takes is a moment for people to get their eyes off of Jesus and start acting in ways that are unhealthy, and 10, 20, 30 years of God's blessing can be thrown away because we said to ourselves, fine, Jesus, we can handle this. And when we say we can handle things, guess what happens? A door comes swinging open, and our deceiver and the one who wants to destroy the church says, thank you very much for taking your eyes off of Jesus, and all things can happen in the church. And you look up and go, whatever happened to XX church? It was receiving the blessings of God. You know what happens? We believe we know what we're doing. We believe that we have the wherewithal to make decisions in our church. Or we believe we know how we should treat people. Lord, help us never become that way. Lord, may we always have a humility in our life to say, I need your leading in my life. We need your leading here at Faith Community. Amen to that? Third, we must die to our self-centeredness. That, seg that is a segue right into this. Because oftentimes when things go awry in the local church, you know what it's about? The self-centeredness of the people that are going to the church. The New Living Translation says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of the sinful nature to his cross, and have crucified them there. I think that's a great way to look at that. Can I say this to us today? 
It is so important for us as a church to understand that Jesus wants us to be one. And there is no way that we could ever become one like Jesus wants us to become if you and I are before this church. Churches have split over the color of carpeting. Churches have split because they changed the time from 1030 to 1045, and it jacked with my ability to go get something to eat after church is done. Now we look and go, really? It was a Shrek, really, really. You want to ask Shrek they did that or whoever it was? Really, really, yes, that is the case. Well, I can't believe we did this. I, and what is the every beginning of every one of those statements? I. I, I, I. If you caught it in Diane's song, there's life at the end of yourself. And when you're willing to say, Lord Jesus, I don't want me to be served anymore in my life. I want you to be served. I want to find my life through you. You find out that, you know what? Jesus is able to take care of the carpeting. He's able to take care of your meal after church. He's able to take care of a different teacher for your class. He's able to take care of the fact that you may not have liked the selection of songs and worship choruses that we had today. The Lord, when he is lifted up in our lives together, he brings life to all of us individually. Amen to that? You want yourself to be served in the church? I can tell you this. You can kill the church, but you're also killing your life in Jesus by being that way. Lord Jesus, I want you to be lifted up in my life. Lord, I want you to be lifted up in faith community, and I will kill myself. Don't take that literally. But I will kill my self-centeredness so that Jesus can be seen in this church. You want a church for your kids? Loosen up. You want a, a church for your grandkids to be able to come to? It's going to look differently than what you want it to be. I'm not saying I have any great designs to do that. But the church, if it's going to be what Jesus wants it to be, one. You and I have got to look past ourselves and say, you know what, this may not be me, but it's not about me. It's about Jesus being lifted up so that he can draw all people unto himself. Amen to that? That's why Jesus prayed that prayer. Lord, Father, may you make my people one. And when God's sovereignty was in place, Jesus came in his sovereign spirit, rushed into those early followers, became a part of their life, cleansed them, empowered them, gave them a vision to understand that Jesus was now the true king of this world, and the world was never the same afterwards. Friend, your life and mine will never, ever be what it was and what it needs to be if Jesus isn't above our own wishes and desires. His spirit can change us and transform us into the people that he wants us to be. And I pray today on the day of Pentecost, when Jesus, who loved his people, came to them, abided within them, said that I will be with you, I'll never leave you. Friend, that energized his church to look at Rome and look at the rest of the world and say, I don't care what you may say, Jesus is the true king of this world, and I'll live for him. Friend, that's when faith community, and that's when our own, and see, there's nothing better than when you see a local church operate the way they can. Nothing better. When you see people's lives change, when you begin to see how God can take the gifts that you may have in your life and use them for his eternal purposes, there's nothing better in your life. 
you'll go home and you'll go to bed and say, I can't wait to get back together again. Jesus' presence is being seen in our midst. I'm listening to a song by Matt Marr. You know who Matt Marr is? Anybody know who Matt Marr is? He said, there's a song, he said, I think it's called In the Room. Listen to it. And he says, I just want to be in the room when you move. And I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving till you do. So tear off the roof. Lower me down. Whatever has to happen, I want to be in the presence of Jesus. Amen to that? And when that becomes the mood and that becomes the burning desire of faith community, Lord, we're getting together on this Thursday. I know there's only going to be four or five or 40 people there, but Lord, would you show up in our midst? This is about you. Guess what's going to happen? Guess what's going to happen? When we show up on a Sunday morning, now I'm not trying to pick at anybody here, but did we say anything along these lines today? Lord Jesus, be with us. Move in our midst like you did at Pentecost. Would you show yourself so that every one of us who leaves goes, the Lord was with his people this morning. Amen to that? You will get tired of me. You probably are. Listen, no. If your only reason is to come and get your ears tickled, if the reason you come is only to rub shoulders with your buddies, that will get tired in a short period of time. But you say amen to this. When we begin to sense the Lord's presence in our midst, when we're willing to come and say, Lord Jesus, I want you to be high and lifted up. Lord Jesus, Sydney said it. We're waiting here for you, Lord. Amen to that? Lord Jesus, here. We're waiting here for you. We want your spirit to change us. Now we got something. And now each one of us will say to ourselves, I don't want to leave. Pastor dismissed us, I guess, if, but I can't wait to get back here next time the doors are open. Because when the Lord is lifted up, it makes sense of all of life, doesn't it? Amen to that? That's why we need a Pentecost. And that's the reason why Jesus is with us today. Amen to that? Pentecost is not something that would just happen. That red symbolizing the purity and the fire of Jesus, we're not looking back. We need Jesus today, don't we? Oh, Lord Jesus, be with us today. You need Jesus today for the things of your life? If you need gas in your car, go fill up your car. You can do that yourself. But I dare say for many of the things in our life, you and I better not tackle the things of our life by ourselves, huh? We need Jesus. We need his presence to help us to be the people we need to be. Amen? Stand to our feet this morning. Lord, we want to tell you thank you. We want to tell you thank you for your goodness to us. And we want to tell you on the day of Pentecost, we need your spirit. We're desperate for you today, Jesus. Emily, come on up. We're desperate for you. None of us is who we are. None of us has arrived. None of us has the strength we need for our life. If any of us just need to pray for a moment, you say, oh, Lord, I just, right now, I just got to humble myself before you. Just come and pray. Just, if the burdens of your life are too big and you're saying, Jesus, I, I need a fresh touch of your spirit, oh, Lord, Give me what I need for this day.